morning, everybody. We are officially in what they call Holy Week, which is exciting, leading up to my favorite day of the year, which is Easter. Um, it's a good day. It's a good day. And today we're going to talk about the triumphal entry. So if you have your Bibles and you want to turn to Matthew 21, we're going to be in the first 11 verses. But before we get there, I'm, I'm going to just say, as you turn, um, if, you have, if you have, if you need a Bible, there are some on the rack back there, or you can use your phone or um, whatever, whatever you see fit. But I would encourage you. I'm using the NIV. I think if they want one, they can go get one. But most people to, to nowadays use their phones. But thank you for offering. It's very sweet. <laughs> so Lord, we just thank you so much for this time that we have together. What a beautiful day. And the sunshine is absolutely fantastic. And just so grateful that the newness of spring is just around the corner. It's even here. And um, with that comes so much more. And so we just thank you that as we open your word today and we learn about more about your journey that you open our hearts and you open our minds. And whatever it is that we brought into this place that may be a distraction to us, I just pray by the power of your spirit that you remove those things now and that you replace those, that space in our mind with your perfect peace so that we can learn about you, so we can encounter you, and so that we can leave different than when we came in. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. All right, so Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11, listen for the word of the Lord. And before I get started, we have been journeying over the last few weeks as we went through Lent, through the life of Jesus, just in little snippets. And so now he's finally approached Jerusalem. And in verse 1, it says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. John, can you mute the monitors? Because I think there's a little bit of feedback. If you don't mind. Um, so... Here we are. Jesus gives the disciples precise instructions regarding the donkey and the colt, including how they're to respond if anybody challenges them. And we can tell from reading scripture and from the Gospels that Jesus usually walked everywhere that he went. And this is the only recorded instance of him actually riding on an animal. Now, this is a fulfillment of prophecy, as we've talked about before, that the, the New Testament... The Gospels, they intersect with the Old Testament. So there's a fulfillment of prophecy that's taking place here. And that fulfillment of prophecy, especially to Matthew as he writes his Gospel, is incredibly important to him because he's writing to a church that's composed primarily of Jewish Christians. And because of their Jewish roots, they would be receptive to the authority of prophecy and especially fulfilled prophecy. Their, their ears would perk up. And when Jesus in verse 5 says, Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey, that's actually from Zechariah 9.9. 9. 
So Jesus is fulfilling the prophecy from the prophet Zechariah. And so Matthew's making it clear that Jesus riding in is a fulfillment of prophecy. And identifying Jesus as king, as it says, say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you. That's going to be an issue here because it's going to set the stage for Pilate as, Jesus, as the next few days kind of roll out. That Pilate's concern is that Jesus is going to establish himself as a king and this is treacherous in the eyes of Rome. And that certainly that can't happen because Pilate is the king of everything. He rules everything and he needs to get rid of the one who's in the way. So on the cross, too, they're going to mock Jesus. If you read Matthew 27, they'll say to Jesus, Hail, King of the Jews! And then there's going to be a plaque that's going to be mounted above him on the cross. This is, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. So they take this, and they turn it to make fun of him and to ridicule him. And the crowds, too, in Matthew 27, are going to mock him, saying... He saved others, but he can't save himself. Is he the king of Israel? Let him come down from the cross now, and then we will believe him. So the fact that he, that Zechariah prophesied that the king is coming on a donkey, I want you just to understand how all of this is going to get twisted in the coming days if you continue to read the passion of Christ. And in verse 9, find this to be interesting. It said the crowds now, in verse 9, it says, the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest heaven. Now, they're waving in different gospels. It says palm branches, but it, they're, they're, they're excited because here he comes. Here comes their king. Here comes their savior. Here comes their messiah. Here, they're, they're excited like he's an Old Testament warrior coming in, not on a white horse, that comes later in Revelation, and we'll get to that in a minute, but on a donkey. And so they're asking Jesus, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna to the, in the highest heaven, they're saying, be our warrior king, fight for us. Take care of our oppression. Take care of all of this. And they're shouting out for him to challenge the political climate. Throw out the Romans. He's here. Finally, he's here. And they're tired of oppression from corrupt leaders. Not much different than what is happening today, right? Corrupt leaders. And they're asking for liberty and they're asking for victory. And yet, in the midst of all of this, they're so excited and they're so happy. Jesus is really the only one who really understands what's going on here. And he has come to establish a kingdom on earth that is going to conquer sin and death and hell and the grave. And Jesus has come and he's fighting a cosmic battle that is bringing his rebellious children back into the family of God by making peace with God. Not by fighting and not through war. He's not there to be a political deliverer who's going to throw off the shackles of Rome. When Jesus doesn't meet their expectations, in fact, which is going to happen if you continue to read on, they turn against him. Kind of like I think probably we sort of do sometimes, right? Lord, if you'll just save my family, if you'll just do this for me, if you'll just bless me with this. Jesus is here! And you have your come to Jesus moment in a Sunday morning on church, and then you go to work on Monday, and ugh, no more. Your language gets foul. You start to be and live back in the world, and the sin starts to creep back into your life again. Until the next Sunday when you walk through the door, Jesus is here. And then you walk out, right? I'm not saying that to be me, because I fall prey to that too, y'all. Just that's what I need Jesus too, because I live in this flesh. So those that hail Jesus as King in just a few days are going to be the same people who are going to say, "Crucify, crucify, give us Barabbas." And 
I want you to note here, and I found this really interesting, and I had never noticed this before until I was going through it this time, and I think this is kind of interesting. So this is my thought, and you can read into it however you want. Notice, Jesus doesn't enter Jerusalem until verse 10. Verse 10, it says, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? And they answered, this is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And this acclamation, I think, the acclamations that he received took place outside of the city. And so I was asked, okay, why did this take place outside of the city? Like, what is going on here? There's a sharp divide that we know from, from the past few weeks that we've been studying. There's a sharp divide between the people of Galilee and the people of Judea. Jesus is from Nazareth. He's a Galilean, and this welcoming crowd outside Judea is probably primarily Galileans. And, and they're, this questioning crowd, I believe, is, it's the people from within the city and within Jerusalem. They're from Judea. And the, where do I get this from? In chapter 20, a large crowd followed Jesus as he left Jericho. And Jesus healed two blind men, who it says in, in verse 34 of chapter 20, who followed him. And then the crowd started to follow him. And I think that it's possible that the crowd that welcomes Jesus outside Jerusalem, it's possible that they are composed of these pilgrims who joined Jesus' entourage at Jericho. They've been journeying along with him. So they know who he is. They've been following him. So I think that there's probably a lot of pilgrims there that were probably from Galilee, that were Galileans. So when he get, comes into Jerusalem and they say, who is this? They hadn't been journeying with him, right? So now they're like, who is this? And I think sometimes we, we should probably ask that question ourselves. Who is this? Do you know who he is? And notice the crowd outside Jerusalem in verse 9 greets him with, they call him Jesus, they say he's the son of David, he's the one who comes in the name of the Lord, but the crowd inside Jerusalem only identifies him as the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So there is a separation here. And you can kind of chew on that and, and dig into that, however, but there's a, there, I just thought, how interesting that he enters the city and then all of a sudden the climate sort of shifts, right? And I think that the inside, like I said, the people inside the city were probably city folk. And they would tend to look down on anybody from Galilee because they were not as sophisticated as city folk. Like, people here from Allegan, can anything good come from Allegan, right? A bunch of hicks that live in the, in the backwoods, right? And when you go into the city, which, oh, it's not my favorite thing to do. Like, we went into Granville to go shopping the other weekend and... Uh, I waited at a stoplight for four lights. I'm like, you don't do that in Allegheny, right? So, I need to look at no, I need to reel back in. So, Galileans were considered to be uneducated. They had a questionable ancestry. They, they were looked down upon. And saying that Jesus is a prophet from Nazareth, to say, no, he's a prophet from Nazareth, that really is a, dis a disparaging comment. Much like when Nathaniel is questioned in John, and he says, can anything good come from Nazareth? Right? Because Jesus was a Galilean. And what's interesting about this is that Israel's rejection of Jesus as Messiah is going to lead to the destruction of their nation just within, a few, just within a few short years. It doesn't take long for the nation of Israel to, to be in turmoil. And so the triumphal entry, we call it the triumphal entry, right? It really isn't triumphal at all. In fact, it's tragic. There's a tragedy that's happening here. This is really is about Israel's unbelief. Their refusal to see Jesus as the Messiah. Their refusal to see him as prophecy being fulfilled. And we condemn Israel for their unbelief and for their hardness of heart. And, but if we're really honest, aren't we just as guilty? And really let that sink in, right? We are just as guilty. And we look at human leaders and we, we look for them to deliver us from our problems. 
So like, does anybody here honestly think that the people who are in political leadership right now are going to deliver us from our problems? We sure hope so though, right? Like, oh, election's coming up, let's get all riled up and beat the other people so that we can fight over this and, and have arguments and, and then, you know, God gets what God wants. It's going to happen. Get out. That, that don't mean don't go vote. Please vote. Please vote. But we insist that Jesus be this triumphal Jesus who overthrows the wicked and he's going to bring prosperity and peace and freedom and he's going to free us from our pain and everything is going to be great. And we don't want to identify with the suffering Savior. We don't want the cross. We don't want the death. We don't want the blood. And yet, Jesus is going to ride in on a white horse. He starts out on a donkey. I love this song. Revelation 19. Oh, I love this so much. One day, y'all, hopefully, hopefully I'll be in heaven when this happens. But, but yeah, you know what? Let Jesus come today. Wouldn't that be pretty sweet? I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he wages, he, he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of the mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. Oh, here's a good part. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings. And Lord of Lords. That's our Jesus. Yeah. Oh, his robe is dipped in blood. So we, we have to have the blood in order to have the salvation. And the weapons that Jesus uses to win this battle, they are his own blood. It's his self-sacrifice. And we're going to take place in, we're going to have communion in a little bit which is for us to remember him until he returns on the white horse. And once you understand who Jesus is and the significance of this victory that he won in death, I think there is no doubt of what the final outcome is going to be. So whatever your circumstance, and maybe you're living in something that's a hot mess, and maybe you're okay, and maybe things are just really, really good for you, but whatever your circumstances, there's one thing that we can know for sure, is that the final outcome is that victory, we fight from victory. We need not be afraid. Sometimes things happen that we don't like and we have, we're uncomfortable and nobody likes to be uncomfortable. There's monstrous regimes all around the world, and, but those regimes are going to come and they're going to go. And lies and deceit are going to continue to spread across this world and across this nation. It might even be people who are talking about you behind your back. But the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will be victorious. That's what matters. And in the meantime, please, 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 please don't compromise. We compromise. Don't we? Yeah. There's still some things that were shackled to us that maybe are, are worldly and we think, well, that's okay. I'm not hurting anybody, right? We compromise. But we are not meant to compromise when these folks are saying, who is this? Who is this? That's a question for you. Who is this? Do you recognize him? Do you know him? When Jesus becomes your king, things start to happen. When you worship the king of kings and the Lord of lords, Things will start to shift. 
The music you used to listen to is going to make you sick to your stomach. You're going to see people treating somebody a certain way, and it's going to just, it's going to make you angry, and you're going to have a righteous anger. We're going to have righteous anger. There are things that are happening in our world where we are to rise up and be different. But yet, we leave here and we slap on some music in our car that's degrading women, right? Sex trafficking is real. We work with women in the jail all of the time who have been used and abused by the men who they thought they could trust. And how does that, that indoctrination gets into the minds of our young. We need to protect the minds of our children so that from pornography, from the, the oh, I could hear, I'm going off on a tangent. I don't want to go too far into the weeds, but you get what I'm saying. We are raising up a generation of warriors who are going to come after us. So we need to lead by example so that they will raise up and protect the marginalized and protect the weak. That's your job too, is to be a voice for the voiceless. It is not okay to be abused. I, know, I grew up in a family where there was abuse and it was awful, awful. There wasn't nobody stepping in and protecting me. Be that for somebody. So Jesus gets this reputation, I think, as, as he goes to the cross. He doesn't speak a whole lot, and he's getting beaten, and he's led to the cross, and he's hanging there. And he was knowing, they thought, oh, he's meek and he's mild. But he was not weak. And we can be meek and we can be mild, but that doesn't mean we are weak. I don't entertain. Don't cast your pearls before swine. That's in the Bible. Don't. I don't waste my energy on stupidity. If it if it's not going to help anything, you just turn and walk. Like you can be meek and mild, but you that you don't have to be meek. You don't. That doesn't mean you're weak. Because we fight from victory, and you were not created to be meek. You have a warrior spirit within you. If you are a believer in Jesus, the Holy Spirit resides within you. You have a warrior spirit within you that is just waiting to rise up. And what you think and what you believe matters, but words are worthless if your actions don't follow your words. You can really tell the character of somebody by how they how they act, how they respond. Words don't mean much of anything. Your reputation, your character, and your integrity matters. And if you hold contrary beliefs, one of the set of those beliefs is going to dominate the other. So we can say, oh, I'm a Christian and I'm a believer, right? But if you really are, if you really don't believe it, and you really don't live into it, then are you really? And I'm not a fire and brimstone kind of person in, by any means, but people, you can tell who people are by their fruit, by the way they treat people, by the way they love on people, by the way they care for people, by the way they care for themselves. Sometimes if we can love on other people, but then we don't really love ourselves very much. So if you believe that Christ's person and work is the foundation for your security, your significance, for your abundance of life, you will live differently. And that's what I want for you, is for when you leave here, for you to live differently. Now one thing we can take away from this text is that when you do outrageous things in the name of Jesus, condemnation is waiting. There's people who are, are just waiting around the corner. Oh, man, look at that. Right? People are going to tell you what to do with your resources. They're going to tell you the way that you're supposed to. Ooh, you're doing it wrong, right? There's critical people out there. But what? when people don't understand, criticism follows. 
and your life and your actions. We are the church, not just in the church. When you leave this building, you are an ambassador for Jesus. You know, let that sink in a minute. You are an ambassador for Jesus. An ambassador is a representative of their king. You represent him. And he, I really believe he wants us to be outrageous and weird. I, well, I, was, I already said it before. I love weird people. I just like weird people. I like, I'm a writer. I love Sally. She's weird. <laughs> I just love weird people. And I want nothing more as we as we go through this week, Holy Week, right? Mm -hmm. Friday is going to be a dark, dark day. They call Saturday Dark Saturday, and but Sunday's coming, y'all. And I want nothing more than when you leave here, for you to leave here knowing how much Jesus loved you. He loved you so much. If you ever watch the, if you ever watch the Passion of the Christ, it makes me sick to my stomach, but I can, I just lose it every time. But one day. He loves you so much that he suffered and died for you, and all of your sins were nailed to that cross. What he got was what you deserve. What we deserve is hell. Honestly, you don't deserve anything. The good things you have in your life and the blessings that we have, that's the grace of God. Lord, we thank you that we have been fed at your table. And we pray that as we go into this week, that you go before us. Give us eyes to see you. Give us opportunities to serve you. And Lord, especially this week being Holy Week, just pray that you go before us and that you guide us and lead us and protect us. Lord, we pray that you send your angels to stand guard around our homes, around our families, that you push back the darkness so that we can see the light and be the light in our homes and in our community. Thank you for being our God. <laughs> It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as you leave this place, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and may he turn his face towards you. I love that imagery of him turning and looking at you. Isn't that beautiful? He turns his face towards you. Go and love. And <laughs> I lost myself. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May he turn his face towards you and give you peace. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.